Greetings, this is Greg. The cockpits in World War II fighter planes had some issues in terms of human factors and ergonomics. This had a lot to do with the fact that aircraft capability and performance improved rapidly during the 1920s and 30s. The human aspect of development just didn't keep up with the technical progress in airframes and engines. To put this into perspective, this was a modern fighter plane in 1932. It's the Boeing P-26. It's an open cockpit fixed gear airplane with 600 horsepower and a fixed pitch propeller. This is a French Diwatine D-500, which also first flew in 1932. This was considered ultra modern at the time. This one is actually a D-510, a 1934 variant, and that variant actually fought in World War II. But again, note the open cockpit. If looking at fighters from 1932, even 1933, just about all of them have an open cockpit. That means there is not much reason to put a heater in one. It's an open cockpit. A heater would add weight and complexity and have virtually no chance of warming the cockpit anyway. Now, these planes could go up pretty high, 25,000, even 30,000 feet in some cases, but they didn't have any performance up there, so it was rarely done. In the cases when they did go that high in testing or for whatever reason, they had to either bundle the pilot up until he looked like the Michelin Man, or more commonly provide an electrical plug in the cockpit for heated gloves or some other type of heated clothing. Additionally, with no cockpit heater, there would be no defogging capability for the windshield. Of course, there was no need for it anyway. Both sides of the glass would be in the same temperature and humidity, so it's not fogging up anyway. But now, let's jump forward just two years to 1935. At this point, nearly every fighter showing up on the scene has an enclosed cockpit. These include the Curtis P-36, the Hawker Hurricane, and the Messerschmitt Bf-109. One year later, the Spitfire made its first flight. All of these planes had enclosed cockpits, but do you think they had heaters? Heating the cockpit wasn't a priority from the designer's point of view. We know that because many European fighters didn't have one. I can't say with certainty why not. I've never read a specific reason in anything approaching an official document, but I think we can imagine what the designers were thinking. That is, that the previous airplanes didn't have heaters, and enclosing the cockpit already provided more comfort, so why would a heater be needed? I should mention that the Curtis P-36 actually did have a heater, but that was unusual at the time, and in this video I want to focus almost entirely on the European aircraft. I think more than anything else, the omissions of a heater really shows how far thinking in terms of human factors was lagging behind the technical progress of the aircraft itself. These new airplanes, because of their climb rates and altitude capability, would spend much more time at altitude than their predecessors. Of course, cockpit heat is only one aspect of human factors, so let's go through a couple of British and one German aircraft to see what some of the different manufacturers were doing. I covered some US aircraft in my previous video, which also laid some groundwork for some of the principles discussed here, instrument flying, for example. Let's start with the Hawker Hurricane. I'm going to use these versions. I think this is a good choice because the 2A variant went into service in September of 1940, just in time for the last month or two of the Battle of Britain. At least that's the way I see it. Although there is some disagreement among historians as to just when that battle started and ended. Also, I want to say that in this specific video, I'll be making no serious effort to match the specific aircraft variant on screen to the type I'm talking about as I normally do. For example, this is a Hurricane Mark I parked here with a Northrop Delta in 1939. On to the human factors discussion. As you've probably guessed, the Hurricane did not have a heater. In fact, as a general rule, British single-engine fighters did not have heaters until the Hawker Typhoon and Tempest came along. What the Hurricane has instead is an electrical plug to allow the pilot to electrically heat clothing. There were several different electrically heated flying suits, but most used in British fighters only warmed the pilot's hands and feet. The pilots of these planes relied mostly on clothing to stay warm and the fact that the British fighters just didn't stay in the air all that long because they didn't carry very much fuel. I should also add that the lack of a heater also means that you don't have a very effective way to defog the windscreen, and in a closed cockpit airplane that can matter. 
Most planes without heaters did have a vent, and that was intended to help with this, but it was still possible to get fog on the inside of the windscreen in some situations, typically when diving from cold temperatures above into more humid air below. The cockpit of the Hurricane also lacks a floor. That means even if it had a heater, it wouldn't be all that effective because the cockpit is essentially open to the entire fuselage aft of the firewall. The heater would have a tough time heating up all that area. Additional downsides to not having a floor are increased noise and increased chances of fumes getting into the cockpit. And if the pilot drops something, it's likely gone until he can get it back after landing. That's especially true if you're in a cockpit where the seat is way above the bottom of the fuselage. Some airplanes like a Spitfire, it's less of a problem because the you're pretty darn close to the bottom of the fuselage anyway. Now the Hurricane also lacks a lockable or steerable tail wheel. That's not good, but in defense of the plane, I can say that this problem is somewhat mitigated by two factors. First, it does have a relatively for the time wide track landing gear. Remember, this is a plane that first flew in 1935. That's important to keep in mind. Second, at the time the plane was designed and well into World War II, the RAF flew mostly off of airfields that were essentially just big, flat, open areas. So they could take off or land into the wind regardless of wind direction. Still, the tailwheel situation, the lack of a floor, the lack of a heater, all count against the hurricane in terms of human factors. However, the plane scores some strong human factors points in other areas. The Hurricanes in the Battle of Britain got constant speed props pretty early, well before the German 109s. So to get the most out of the propeller, the pilot only had to push the prop lever full forward and leave it there until in a situation where fuel economy was preferable to performance needs. During the Battle of Britain, most 109s didn't have constant speed props. They had a variable pitch prop, which increased the pilot's workload. I actually have a whole video about this, so no need to talk about it anymore here. The Hurricane also has excellent flight instruments. In fact, the British were some of the earliest adopters of artificial horizons and gyro instruments in general, which gave the British pilots the ability to control the plane while in the clouds or in situations where there was no visible horizon. In my previous video on human factors, I go into this extensively. If you didn't watch it, well, you should, but if not, just know that without gyro instruments, controlled flight without a visible horizon is impossible. And the Royal Air Force was one of the few air forces with its planes so equipped at the start of the war in Europe. Furthermore, all six of the flight instruments are located in an easy to read arrangement. In the center of the upper row, we have the attitude indicator, moving clockwise from there, vertical speed indicator, turn and bank indicator, directional gyro, AKA heading indicator, altimeter and airspeed indicator. Even today, these are the standard six instruments used when flying when no visible horizon exists. These are essentially just like the instruments in a P-47 Thunderbolt, except in the Hurricane, they're in a much better arrangement. The British style turn and bank indicator, which as far as I know was unique to the British and died out shortly after World War II, is a bit odd and in my view, a little more difficult to use than the US type, but still pretty good. Of course, that directional gyro will process over time and have to be reset relative to the magnetic compass, just like in most other airplanes with this type of instrument. Note it's also a drum type directional gyro, which I talked about in the previous video. It's not a great way to display heading information and is a human factors liability, but by World War II standards, it's pretty normal, and at least the plane has a directional gyro. Now, one thing that's a bit unusual in British fighters is the magnetic compass. It looks like something borrowed from the Royal Navy. This thing looks like it belongs on one of Admiral Nelson's ships. I couldn't find a single clear picture of one that doesn't have faded markings, which is unfortunate. All the examples that exist today seem to have very faded lines on them, so we have to make do with this one. Now, the way this works is this. There is a needle it's very hard to see because the line is faded on this gauge, and but it sort of looks like the letter T, and it points to the north, like a compass needle points to the north. It does that assuming the plane is in straight and level flight. The pilot then rotates the outer ring, which will line up the red north part of that ring with the T, the magnetic pointer. 
the course of the aircraft, or rather the magnetic heading, can then be read by a lubber line, which is also faded on this particular compass. This thing is a lot more work to use than a plain Jane whiskey compass often seen in other airplanes. So I don't know why the Royal Air Force love these things so much, but they put them in almost everything. I suppose an argument can be made that it's more accurate, but I don't know. Maybe it is, but if so, you're talking about a half a degree or something, but no pilot can fly that accurately anyway for any period of time, and certainly not with any World War II era instruments. From my perspective, this thing is extra work with no practical benefit. It requires the pilot to look down pretty far and for some time while he manipulates it to get his magnetic heading. Having to look away from the gauges to perform a normal task is a human factors issue in a single pilot airplane. As explained in the earlier video, it's especially undesirable during instrument flight. Overall, the Hurricane's cockpit isn't bad. Most of the key items are in front of the pilot, and most of the controls are in places that make sense. I suppose one exception there is the very odd gear and flap control. Both are controlled by one lever. Normally, gear and flap controls are not only two separate levers, they're usually made so that they have a totally different feel from one another, different knobs and stuff to reduce the chance of a mix-up. This just seems like a bad idea to me, and I guess to everyone else too, since this type of selector certainly didn't catch on. Also, it's on the right side. You generally want your gear and flaps to be on the left in an airplane where you're flying it with a control stick so that you don't have to switch hands on the control stick to manipulate the gear and flaps. Of course, we should keep in mind, again, this is a plane from 1935, and the design work started much earlier. It was one of the first fighters with retractable gear and flaps, let alone hydraulically controlled gear and flaps. Human factors just had not caught up. Overall, the human factor situation in the hurricane isn't too good. No heater, no floor, a compass that requires extra steps to use and is in an awkward position. Then we have the gear and flap selector that's odd and it's on the right side. However, the hurricane does have good for the time flight instruments and a cockpit that is overall laid out reasonably well. Plus it got that constant speed prop early in the war. So that really helps if you're talking about human factors during the Battle of Britain. Let's take a look at the Spitfire. I almost sort of dread talking about Spitfires. Among World War II airplane enthusiasts, there are two groups of people easily offended by facts. I'll probably hear from both of them after this video. To that end, I'll leave a form at the end uh, that can be filled out, sent in to help me avoid offending you in the future. I do like the Spitfire, I really do, but I'm not looking at it through the clouded lens of emotions, just the facts. And by that standard, the cockpit isn't great. There are a lot of Spitfire versions and some variation, sometimes even within the versions. Plus, there were some types that were pretty rare and hard or impossible to get information on. So I can't cover every possible Spitfire mark here. I'm going to limit this to Mark 1s, 2s, 5s, and 9s. That pretty well covers most of the war. In terms of human factors, all the Spitfires are close to the same anyway. In fact, in terms of human factors, the Spitfires were a lot like the Hurricanes, which sort of makes sense. Let's start with the good. Like the Hurricanes, the Spitfires got constant speed props in time for the Battle of Britain. These were Spitfire Mark 1s and 2s, and that gave them an edge over the 109 E3s and E4s. I'll use cockpit photos from this Spitfire Mark 5C in the U.S. Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio. There are just not a lot of good pictures of Mark I and II cockpits, which were the Battle of Britain versions, but the Mark V is close enough. As you can see, like the Hurricane, it has great flight instruments and in a good layout. That's a big plus, especially by 1940 standards. Yes, this is a Mark V, but the ones and twos have the same instruments. In terms of flying characteristics, the Spitfire is outstanding. NACA, who finds stuff to complain about with everything, really didn't have anything but praise for the Spitfire's flying qualities. The Spitfire's cockpit layout is okay. There's nothing really, really wrong with it. The flap control is oddly placed up high on the instrument panel. The gear, uh, landing gear controls on the right side, which is not desirable. But these things aren't a huge deal. Overall, like the Hurricane, everything for the most part is within easy reach and in a mostly logical layout. So it flies well, has great instruments, and an okay, especially by 1940 standards, cockpit. So far, it's a human factors win, but of course there are some problems. It's probably not a surprise that 
it has most of the same human factors liabilities of the hurricane, plus a little bit more. No heater, no floor, no defogging, no lockable or steerable tailwheel, all problems. The lack of a lockable tailwheel is a bigger problem in the Spitfire than the Hurricane because the Spitfire has a very narrow landing gear, which makes it tricky on takeoff and landing. Almost half of all aircraft lost in World War II were lost in non-combat situations, and a lot of those were on takeoff and landings. And by some statistics, it's more like two-thirds of all losses were non-combat. The cockpit in the Spitfire is pretty small. It's cramped. The seating position in the plane is up relatively high relative to the rudder pedals, which is the reason the control yoke is hinged halfway up for that lateral movement. That way it can get full travel to control the ailerons and not hit the pilot's legs. The problem here isn't the control yoke, but rather it's the seating position, which itself has a lot to do with the design of the fuselage. Now that seating position is kind of an allied aircraft thing but it reduces the G-load the pilot can handle before blacking out as compared to what we see in the German 109s and FW-190s. I feel this reduces the effectiveness of the Spitfire's greatest attribute, which is its maneuverability. The plane has that same awkward compass that the Hurricane uses. One thing that I forgot to mention with the Hurricane was its braking system. It's essentially the same on both aircraft. These use pneumatic systems activated by a lever on the control stick. It's very awkward to use. Remember, there's no steerable tailwheel, so the plane has to be taxied and steered on the ground via differential braking. However, unlike U.S. or German airplanes, there are no toe brakes on the rudder pedals. Instead, what you do is you squeeze that lever and press the rudder in the direction you would like to turn. The system then applies that brake. It's awkward to use, and there is a delay in the system, probably due to the compressibility of air. This type of control system for taxiing died out long ago and for good reason, but the British were not the only ones to use it. The Soviets did for a time as well. On that subject, I'm not going to say much about the Soviet aircraft in this video, but they have most of the problems of the British aircraft, with the addition of very poor instrumentation and generally awkward controls. An example of poor instrumentation is the fact that the vast majority of Soviet World War II single-engine fighters have no attitude indicator. They also have oddball issues like carbon monoxide poisoning the crew, canopies that won't open at high speeds, uh, preventing bailouts. Sometimes they had canopies that had to be opened to read the fuel gauges on the inboard section of the wing, and all sorts of weird issues. The controls and positions in Soviet aircraft were pretty bad as well. That's one thing that's just not reflected in modern simulation because we just bind everything to our HOTAS, at least until virtual reality sims become more mainstream. The upside of most of the Soviet fighters is that they flew pretty well and generally had quite good landing gear. Back to the British stuff, in short, both the Spitfire and Hurricane are sort of a mixed bag. Both have excellent flight instruments, good flying qualities, and okay cockpit layouts. The downsides are that they lacked a lot of amenities found in U.S. airplanes like heaters, a floor, and a controllable or lockable tailwheel. Of course, we still need to keep in mind these were early airplanes. In terms of human factors, the later designs like the Hawker Typhoon were quite a bit better. Next up, we have the Germans. I'm only going to cover the FW-190. I know, the 109 was their main fighter from the start of the war until the end. I get that. However, the 109 has so many versions, and unlike the Spitfire, they varied a lot from start to finish in, in terms of what's in the cockpit. I just can't do the 109 justice in a video like this one, a video that's intended as a sort of general overview. The FW-190 is the closest thing we have to a human factors dream airplane in World War II. It really is that good. However, there is a big chink in the armor of the early models. Let's talk about the 190A3. Notice there is no artificial horizon. It doesn't have a directional gyro either. The only gyro instrument in this thing is the turn needle. That might get you through a very short duration climb or descent through a thin cloud layer, maybe, but that's about it in terms of instrument flying. This is a plane suitable for visual daytime flying, and that's about all. If it wasn't a warplane, that wouldn't be an issue, but it is a warplane, and a lot of the time it's cloudy over Germany. I'm sure pilots of these planes had to fly missions in marginal weather. That instrument package will make it very difficult to fly the plane in the clouds. Not impossible, but very difficult and even dangerous. This is a huge human factors liability. 
This was actually really common in European fighters early in the war. Good flight instruments, gyro instruments like what we saw in the British fighters were the exception, not the rule. The Germans did realize that their pilots needed gyro instruments, so they added an artificial horizon to the FW-190 in the A-5 and later variants. I should say that I have never seen the cockpit of a 190A-4, so maybe those had them, or maybe some of them, but the A-5s all had them for sure. Also, the BF-109s, starting with the G models, had artificial horizons, and earlier variants generally did not. So it seems that Volker Wolf and Messerschmitt woke up and smelled the coffee at about the same time. Let's pull up the manual for the FW-190A5, Chapter 7, take a look at the cockpit. By the way, if you haven't already, please subscribe, and I would really appreciate it if you would consider joining my Patreon. It's very low cost. The link is in the video description. Patreon members often get early access to videos, and those videos are ad-free during the early access period. That ensures I don't miss any questions in the comments section from my supporters. Patreon members also get access to all the manuals and documents I use in creation of these videos, including this German manual for the FW-190, A5, and A6. Back to our program, I want to take a close look at the flight instruments. As you can see, the quality in the manual isn't so great. There are not many pictures of the A5's cockpit either. However, the A8 and its ground attack variant, the F8, both have cockpits which are very similar to the A5. The gauge layouts are slightly different but close enough. This is an F8, so let's zoom in and take a look at the instrument panel. You will notice right away that the 190 really has two instrument panels. The upper one, which is closer to the pilot's head and has the gauges that would have been looked at the most. The lower and farther forward panel has gauges that would only be checked occasionally, usually to make sure things are within limits, temperature, fuel quantity, that sort of stuff. In other words, the upper panel has the gauges that the pilot uses to fly the airplane and looks at frequently. Rather than putting arrows on the screen, as I usually do, as we go along, I'm just going to talk through this. We'll see how that works, but I think the 190's cockpit is laid out so well we're going to be fine. Starting on the left side, we have the altimeter. It's in meters. It says KM on it for kilometers, 1,000 meters. Above and to the right, we have the airspeed indicator. Next, we have a combination gyro instrument. It's an artificial horizon and a turn coordinator. This is very unusual in fighters from other nations. These, if installed, would be two separate gauges. The artificial horizon portion gives pitch and bank information. The needle gives rate of turn, or more correctly, rotation around the plane's vertical axis. The ball gives slip skid information. From a human factor standpoint, this combination gauge initially seems like a good idea. That's because the pilot's instrument scan is now simplified, two gauges in one. The downside is that if one portion of this thing fails, say the horizon, and it gets stuck at a 30 degree bank, it's going to be very hard for the pilot to mentally ignore that when trying to fly by using the turn needle alone. And don't underestimate the difficulty here. Even when they are not separate gauges, it's really hard to ignore a bad or tumbled attitude indicator during instrument flying. In fact, I think it's advisable to cover it up if possible, but that's not even an option in this situation. Moving to the right, we have vertical speed in meters per second, then the remote indicating compass. This is another mixed bag. The remote indicating compass itself is great. It's much better than the typical whiskey compass, like the one in the P-47, and it's better than what was in the Spitfire. Many versions of the P-51 Mustang and the Corsair have a remote indicating compass, but this one is better. I like it because the pointer is shaped like an airplane. Whatever heading the little airplane is pointing to is your heading. Now, the little plane itself rotates. It's not like a modern directional gyro. Thus, in this case, if we were flying on a 340 heading, the little airplane would be pointing to about 3 o'clock, but we can rotate the outer ring to bring 340 up to the 12 o'clock position to help stay oriented. Like all World War II aircraft compasses, it will have errors in a turn. Thus, you can't really rely on this thing in other than straight and level flight. If on instruments and on a heading of, say, 310, and you want to turn to 340, you would turn at a rate of about 3 degrees per second for 10 seconds. Roll out of the turn, check your heading on the remote compass. Remember, the turn needle gives rate of turn. I don't know how it's calibrated, but I suspect one or maybe two needle widths would equate to about three degrees per second. Obviously, this is not as good for instrument flying as having a real directional gyro, uh, 
a directional gyro, you would be able to rely on it in turns, like the ones we saw on the British fighters. The 190's compass is a great compass, but not a true substitute for some sort of gyroscopic heading instrument. To the right of that, we have manifold pressure, and then to the right and down, engine RPM. So in terms of human factors, this instrument layout has its pros and cons. They get an A for effort, as this stuff was new. The idea of clearly separating the really important gauges from the others is sound. I really like the way they're very prominent and up near the windscreen. The downside is that layout of the flight instruments. With them all in a line like that, in my view at least, it makes scanning them more difficult than it is with a typical six-pack kind of setup like what's in a Spitfire. I'm not too sure about that combined horizon turn coordinator thing. I get what they're trying to do there, but as someone who has flown, taught, and observed instrument flight with failed instruments, I know that it can cause serious problems. The lack of a directional gyro is a downer. Focal Wolf was really trying for a human factors home run with this, but I think they only got to about second base. The rest of the cockpit is a home run. Above the instrument panel on the left side are the ammunition counters. Very few, if any, non-German World War II fighters had ammo counters. Obviously, this is helpful to the pilot, and it's a great feature. The engine controls are very advanced and highly automated. All the pilot has to do is move the throttle control fore and aft. All propeller and mixture settings are automatic. In the early 190s, the pilot doesn't even have any cooling shutter controls to manage, and in the A5s and later he does, but only one. And even that typically won't have to be manipulated more than once between takeoff and landing. That, when combined with the logically placed engine gauges, really helps the human factor situation. In terms of human factors, easy to use is good, and no World War II fighter has an easier to use engine management setup than the FW-190s. Other important controls are located near the throttle and are very well thought out. For example, the flap and gears are controlled by buttons. If you want landing flaps, you push that button. Furthermore, the design is such that you can find the correct button entirely by feel without moving your hands far from the throttle. It's not quite like a HOTAS system we would see in later jets, but the idea is here in principle. See this red button? This kills the entire electrical system. It disconnects the battery and the generator, depowering everything electric. Keep in mind the engine will still run because it doesn't require aircraft power. It's self-sustaining. So why would you do this? Because if you suddenly have electrical smoke or an electrical fire because of battle damage or something else, it's a lot faster for the pilot to hit that button than to fumble around for the battery and generator switches and turn them off. It's not that you couldn't shut down electrical power without that button, but the button makes it easier during a stressful time. The 190's cockpit is all about making things easy. The entire cockpit is well set up. The circuit breakers act as on-off switches for everything in the electrical system, which simplifies the cockpit. It also makes it easier to find the circuit breaker if you need to, because you roughly know where it is because you press it all the time. Furthermore, the breakers are divided up into two main categories. Those that you will press once on pre-flight and then probably forget about until shutting the plane down after landing. These are breakers that provide power to things like the landing gear system, radios, artificial horizon if installed, and so on. Once set, the pilot can close the little panel which covers those breakers because they likely won't be needed again during flight. The other breakers are here. These are things that may need to be manipulated between pre-flight and shutdown. There are various fuel pump breakers and one that connects and disconnects external power if it's plugged in. The only significant human factors fault that I can find in the FW-190 is the lack of an artificial horizon in the early models. And I'm not even sure that's a human factors fault, as when it was designed, I don't think the need for instrument flying in fighters was well understood. As a pure visual conditions airplane, it's of course not a factor. Oh, and of course, it doesn't have a heater. So, okay, that's a biggie. However, it does have a cockpit floor and an electrical plug for a heated suit. Not great, but a lot better than no floor and no plug. Of course, soon the threat of high altitude daytime bombers would require German fighters to routinely climb through one or two thick cloud layers to attack the bombers, then to send back through the overcast while dealing with P-47s or whatever in pursuit. The need for instrument flying became apparent, which is probably why they put artificial horizons into German fighters starting with the 109G and 190A5. Now the 190s were relatively easy to fly. They had a very strong wide track landing gear and a tailwheel, which although not steerable, 
would lock if the stick was pulled all the way aft. Thus, it was about like a P-47 in that respect, although with a better way of locking it. The designer of the FW-190 Kerr tank put a lot of focus on making the plane easy to operate so that the pilot could focus on the mission. Shortly after U.S. manufacturers inspected this airplane, you started to see FW-190 light cockpits start to show up. You can see a lot of that in the F4U Corsair-4, which I covered in the previous video on this channel. Of all the fighters in World War II, the FW-190 was the first to really put human factors into the cockpit design as a primary consideration. And overall, it has the best cockpit of any of the numerically significant fighters. Please like and subscribe and consider joining my Patreon. That's all for now. Goodbye and have a great day.